Our next speaker is Kathleen Michael, who earned her bachelor's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her master's in arts of teaching from Webster University. She now works at Monterey Peninsula College, where she works with students on their reading and writing skills, which as a teacher has always been my favorite thing to do. So thank you for doing that work with college students. And she has a book coming out next year that I think many of you will be very interested in. It is called Working in Yellowstone, The Best Summers of Our Lives. And it is stories and photos from mostly young people who took summer jobs in Yellowstone and is the tale of how that really changed the course of their lives. It's coming out next year, so watch for it at the book exhibit at next year's history conference. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for attending our session because I know you had other opportunities that were also very interesting. So my name is Kathleen and I'm a Yellowstone addict. I admit it. Uh, in the 1970s, I spent three summers working in Yellowstone. It had a huge impact on my life. And I went back in 2019 to try to replicate the experience. I worked in the same store, lived in the same dorm. And, you know, being 66 at the time, it just wasn't quite the same as when you're 18. But um, I actually felt kind of sorry for the young people who were there because it wasn't as much fun as when I was there, you know, due to tightening regulations and restrictions. Um, and because of the hiring pool, most of the people that work in Yellowstone now are senior citizens. So if you haven't worked in the park, in fact, how many people have been to Yellowstone? Okay, excellent. How many people have worked in Yellowstone? All right, we have some, a few who know what I'm talking about then. It's a very addicting thing to do. So I wanted to learn more about the employee experiences in the past because I thought the 70s were wonderful. And so I interviewed people in the 60s and then the 50s, and it, they all had terrific times. And then I spent time at the archives to read memoirs from earlier years. And it had the same influence on a lot of us. We all, it changed our lives, made us more interested in Western things, you know, the whole cowboy thing, even though we were wearing our bell bottoms and, and halter tops, we still felt like we were, we were Westerners. All right. So my topic today are the feminist managers in Yellowstone, because this is one of those rabbit holes I fell in while I was working on my book that was just so interesting. And the women at that time were called, if you were a feminist, you were called a new woman. All right. And that was a woman that was born after the Civil War and before 1900 and who did not want to stay on the farm. They did not want to be the farmer's daughter or the farmer's wife. And they did pretty much anything they could to get out of that lifestyle. And there were more options after the Civil War. The Railroads were, were now available for transportation, so it wasn't as much of a hardship to go from back east out to the west as it had been before. Women could travel alone. There were also more educational opportunities, and it was kind of one of those things that once you got your degree, you didn't necessarily want to go back to just doing housework. Um, a lot of women decided to pursue intellectual interests and they did that at the expense of marriage. All right. So as you can see, the, the new woman was not loved by all. <laughs> there were a lot of negative stereotypes that they're man haters, that they, um, you know, aren't, aren't good Christians, that, uh, they just want to get out in the world and leave their husband and child behind. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were swimming upstream in order to pursue intellectual pursuits after college. And there were very few opportunities that if you did want to not get married and you didn't want to work on the farm, you basically had three areas to focus on. One was religion. You could be a missionary. <laughs> Another was that you could be a teacher. And then another was that you could be a nurse, which had only recently become more respectable after the Civil War. All right. And another thing that was interesting about the new woman is they wanted to do more physical activities. And so this is actually a cartoon making fun of the new woman. But this is a group of women in Yellowstone. 
around 1900 at the canyon. And just the idea of wearing a long dress like that at the edge of the cliff makes me so nervous. <laughs> I guess they all survived, but um, I, I don't, wouldn't get that close ever. In any case, they were brave. Now, it is ironical we're going to talk about a man for a few minutes um, because he was the one who basically opened the door to women being in managerial positions in Yellowstone National Park. There were two main ways to stay in the park. One was to stay at the hotels, and the other was to go on camping trips. The hotels were kind of like the railroad, gilded age, robber baron type of enterprises. The camping was done by a very progressive era type of person, Mr. W Professor Wiley, who was from Muskingum, Ohio. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he was very influenced by his religion, which was Reformed Presbyterianism, his family, which there are so many Wileys in, in Ohio that you can't throw a rock and not hit one. Yeah. And also his uh he was a big believer in education for women and men. And he had all his daughters go to college. And then he loved Yellowstone. He came out to Yellowstone around the 1870s and he started a tour company that went through the park around 1883. And it was just a small enterprise. He basically targeted teachers and church groups to go through the park because he wanted people who were interested in learning about the science of the park rather than just have a spa type of experience. All right. So in 18, 1890s, he decided that he wanted to have a permanent camp. He wanted permanent camps around the park rather than just going through with the wagon and doing these tours two or three times a summer. And that caused a lot of controversy, but nevertheless, he got his camps established, and he wanted them staffed by people who were like him. And so the first thing he did was he hit up all his relatives, and they ended up being the cooks, the drivers, the, the camp matrons, and he wanted to make sure they were all of good repute, so most were Presbyterian. <laughs> and... I read in one newspaper article that if you're looking for the Presbyterian church in the summer, you need to go down to Yellowstone. <laughs> so there was definitely that aspect to it. All right, these were small camps at the time. They might only have 15 people or so working there. Most of them were women, and the women that were in charge of the camp were usually a relative of Professor Wiley's, who were usually college graduates. All right, so we want to talk about a woman who maybe some people here have heard of. Her nickname was Lady Mac at Yellowstone. And she's also from Muskingum, Ohio. And she's his first cousin, Professor Wiley's first cousin. It's not known exactly the first date that she started working in Yellowstone. There's some contradictory primary sources that I found. But I did find that in 1892, she, who was at this time a missionary in Selma, Alabama, was up in Bozeman the first weekend of June with her sister, who was a missionary from Utah, and they were leaving the same week that the Wiley tour was leaving. So we can, as I at least can assume, or I'll draw the dots and say that he was putting his cousins to work on the, on the wagon trains going around the park in, by 1892. So this is interesting. This is a picture I found at the Yellowstone Heritage and Research Center. And I noticed this little school flag at Geneva College. And made me interested, you know, what's, what's the connection between Geneva College? So I contacted the archivist and Lady Mack had graduated from Geneva College. It's a, a college for Reformed Presbyterians. <laughs> and so guess who she recruited? <laughs> this is from an album from one of her nephews who also worked at Yellowstone. All right, that is a picture of Geneva College. 
Um, I've had a really good experience with the Geneva College archivist because they did not know they had a Yellowstone connection. And come to find out, they furnished many of the managers and many of the employees were the first few years of the Yellowstone experience. All right, just a little bit more about uh, Lady Mac. This right here, where it says the P is the school for former slaves and slaves' children in Selma, Alabama. And that is where Lady Mac spent her winters. She taught down there. Um, from what I've read, of, I haven't read her account by her, but from what I've read from students, they were not well accepted in the community. And they basically kept to themselves because Selma was still pretty hostile to people from the North coming down and, and helping African-Americans improve their lot. All right, Lady Mack worked with Wiley until he sold the company in 1905. The company was then bought by A.W. Miles, who was a politician um, up in Montana, and he smartly employed her, continued to employ her during the summers. And you can tell that the crowds of people started to increase, all right, and they needed more employees. Um, they went up to about 700 employees a summer. So that's, she ended up being headquartered at Canyon. And the last that I can find uh, date that she was there was probably around 1934. This is a picture of her crew in 1930. She's a middle-aged woman in the middle. Or at least I think middle aged now. I just think she was old. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love this picture because you can see the the wranglers, the waitresses. You know, this is a big. This is so much more than what was there in eighteen ninety two. I mean, this is a big crew to manage. Plus, she was in charge basically of uh, reviewing all the applicants for all the camps. All right, here's a Montana lady. How many people have heard the last name Qua? No? Okay, the Qua is a big name in Belgrade. Uh, Thomas Qua was the founder of Belgrade, Montana. And he had he was very he was pretty wealthy, very successful man. And so therefore his children had the opportunity to socialize in the best groups, and his daughter got to be the queen of the sweet pea festival in Bozeman. <laughs> Um, she and her mother ran the West Thumb Camp Lunch Station for Wiley's company um, from around 1902 to 1906. Her mother died and she just ran it herself. She graduated from MSU. Um, her brother ended up being a famous band leader, Gene Qua, who had a band that played in Yellowstone. But um, she was a very interesting woman with a lot of accomplishments. She got into the film business and made films for the government and uh, was quite an achiever, besides being, you know, pretty. <laughs> All right, here's a picture of the thumb station during the time when Mignon was managing it. You can see it went from the camps to the more permanent buildings. Unfortunately, it no longer exists. All right, the next one we'll talk about is Elizabeth Johnson, Geneva College. <laughs> she was a music teacher at Geneva, and she ran what was called Geyser's Camp, which was what we would call the Old Faithful area now. And she was there from around 1907 to around 1916. She was very popular. She brought in a crew from Geneva College every summer to work. This is a picture of her with a pack rat at Geyser Camp. A pack rat was the name for a porter. Mm -hmm. And you can see as a megaphone, which I think is kind of fun, um, to see kind of the tent cabins behind them. And um, there's a wonderful description of the Geyser Camps written on a blog that you can find on the, on the internet called Be you Blythe and Bonnie. And it's from a woman who was working at Geyser Camp that summer. And she talks about Miss Johnson and how they would steal food at night for their parties and things like that. So it's, it's really a great read. 
All right, now we're gonna talk about Anna Highwinkle. Anna is, is very special to me. She came from probably the most distressed background. She was a first generation American. Her parents were from Prussia. Um, she lived on a farm and she and her older sister got their nurses training. And as soon as they got their nurses training, they were out of there. They were from Evansville, Indiana. And first they moved to California and lived in the Southern California area where they did nursing. And I'm not sure how they got to Yellowstone or why they got to Yellowstone, but they were, she was there before cars. So she was there before 1915 and she was there until the 1930s. This is a picture of her later. This woman right there. This is her with the opening crew for Old Faithful in 1924. Uh, she had many different positions in Yellowstone. Sometimes she was the head cook, sometimes she was the head housekeeper. And then she started managing the whole lodges. And uh, she was she participated in year-long activities for former employees. This is a picture of her oh. <laughs> feeding the bears. <laughs> this was a photograph taken by the Union Pacific Railroad photographer as an advertisement. This was the year when she was a cook at the lake complex. And she had just no fear. I have, I was so fortunate. I found a relative of hers on Ancestry.com. And she was able to give me, this is the original photograph. And then we'll see, this is what the postcard looked like. And as you can see, they, they even fixed people's images back in those days. She's, <laughs> she's a little bit thinner and a little bit younger. <laughs> but I think it's just so wonderful to get to see uh, how her legacy is just frozen forever there. This is a picture of her crew. This is another picture that her niece was able to give to me. These, of course, are not new women. These are basically flapper era women. And they all worked. And I just think this group, I love this picture because they just look like people you could hang out with and that are fun and friends. And it just shows you that uh, there were a lot of women that worked at Yale. So it's pretty much seven to one for men. This is an interesting thing that I had no idea beforehand. This is a reform school in California in Ventura. It doesn't exist anymore. Anna worked her winters there, and she was in charge of the, the incorrigibles. <laughs> and um, because she was very tall and big and maybe had a presence that um, they needed. <laughs> one, one thing that I found interesting was that Lady Mac then started working here after her own father died, and she worked with uh, Anna Highwinkle at this reform school. But that didn't last long. I don't think she was cut out for that. <laughs> this is Cora Varney. She was one of 12 children on her farm and they didn't have money, but she kept attending semesters when she could at the University of Iowa. And while she was there, she started the Octave Thanet Club, which I had never heard of, but it was, it was a feminist group that was anti-suffrage that voting was below women because you had to compromise. And so she started that club and, um, but nevertheless, she was a frustrated businesswoman. She kept trying business enterprises, uh, but in trying to go to school and she just couldn't do both. This is a picture of her in a store in Iowa. It's called the Golden Rule. Amazingly, she decided to move to Hawaii. She went for training at the YWCA to learn how to be the head of a YMCA chapter and took over the Honolulu branch. This is the Honolulu YWCA. It's called the Homestead. And supposedly she made all kinds of major improvements to it. It had been kind of a social club for plantation owners' wives. And she made it more a vehicle for young women to learn business skills and typing and socializing with other people of the same religion. This is a picture of Lake Camp, which is where uh, 
Miss Varney worked most of the time. And this is the time period when she was there in the early 1920s. And this is, she tried unsuccessfully to start her own concession after working in Yellowstone. She wanted to do it at the Volcano House. And I'm not sure why it didn't succeed. It might've been because she was not wealthy. She was not married. Um, and but she tried, which I thought was very admirable. In that time, she put herself out there to try to become the first concessionaire there. Here's a picture of Mammoth, where she also worked. I'm sorry for the blurriness. If you, well, those of us who are here were probably all too young, but this was torn down in 1940. And there was a big swimming pool here, then the cabins, and then the lodge, and then some additional cabins. Um, there's still a lot of remnants. I went, I was in the park last week, and there are all kinds of shards of pottery and china and things that you can see where it had been. All right, this is Beulah Brown. Has anyone heard of Beulah Brown? No. Nope. Okay, good. All right, she was probably came from the most prosperous background. Her father was a minister, and she was very extroverted. She, of course, graduated from a Presbyterian college, and she taught biology, English speech. She wanted to expand her horizons, and so she moved to Montana. She moved to Deer Lodge, and while she was at Deer Lodge, she heard about jobs at Yellowstone. This is a picture of her when she was young. This just shows you how the new women were into sports. This, they were playing the new game called basketball. And she's at number six. She was very athletic. She led hikers in Yellowstone down into the canyon where the waterfalls are and up. <laughs> this is a picture of her in 1923 as the recreation director at Canyon. Um, she has started as regular kitchen help, became a recreation leader, and she wrote all kinds of plays and she wrote songs because there was entertainment every night at Yellowstone in the 1920s. And so she was a big promoter of that. She ended up being the manager of Mammoth and then Old Faithful. She actually got married. <laughs> she was probably around 45 and she married the man who was managing the Old Faithful cafeteria. And because she was also very motivated and determined, she wanted to start a concession company too. And she had, because she was married, they made him the president and she was below him and they started the National Park Concessions Company. And where you see those little red dots like Big Bend and Mammoth Caves, um, they started their own concession business. And in, into the 1950s, she hired Anna Highwinkle to run the cabins at Mammoth Caves. So they had this connection that continued. This is Mrs. or Dr. Dina Evans. She's the first PhD in drama in the United States. She was a teacher in, I believe, Bozeman, but she's originally from Ohio. And she got her PhD in Iowa. And so of course, as manager and as head of entertainment, she put on had plays put on. This is a King Tut play because <laughs> everything in Egypt was very popular at the time. And there she is. Now I'll, I'll finish up with this one because I'm starting to run out of time. This is an Aura Cup. She was one of my favorites because she was from Missouri on the farm. Took she became a teacher by examination. And then she wanted to graduate from college. So every summer she would go to Chicago and she would work at the Hull House, the Hull House Settlement House. And she got her degree after 12 years. And then she was out of there. She moved to California. She moved to Salinas, which is where I went to high school. She was John Steinbeck's favorite English teacher. <laughs> This is the lodge she managed. She was the very first manager of Roosevelt Lodge. Anyway, this is another section, but we'll stop there because I my time is up and I'll be happy if you're interested in hearing more and it's lunchtime, I'd be willing to chat. Thank you.